Welcome back. This is Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm your instructor, David Leitner. And today we're going to talk about Neanderthal anatomy. What makes a Neanderthal? We're also going to talk a little bit about DNA as well. What do we know from the DNA of Neanderthals? And what does it tell us about our own past? So, without further ado, let's get started. So, Many of the differences between anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals are in the skull, certainly the most noticeable ones uh, at first glance. Uh, Neanderthals have a very robust double arched um, brow ridge. Uh, it, uh, um, uh, it's one of the most prominent features of the face, and it's very hard to miss. Along with that, they have inflated cheeks or angled cheeks. Instead of their cheeks being kind of uh, uh, um, flush with their face, they, uh, instead of being flush, they angle out like that in the midfacial region. We call this midfacial prognathism um, or midfacial projection. Uh, the nasal passage is extremely high and wide. This is a cold adaptation. They have shovel-shaped incisors that are quite large that um, we often show wear and tear as if they were used as tools. And uh, they have a long, uh, low cranial vault, uh, but with a very large cranial capacity. Some of the largest cranial capacities um, are like 1,700 cc's. And I'll remind you, modern humans, the average cranial capacity is about 1,350 so that's pretty significant. Likewise, they have something called an occipital bun, which is just a sort of prominence sort of on the back of the skull here. And I actually think I might have one. I don't know. Um, uh, a large juxtamastoid eminence that's less important. Uh, they have a space behind their rear molars. And again, no chin. Only Homo sapiens have chins. Uh, really interestingly, they have uh, uh, they have teeth that are kind of unique. Um, we call their teeth torodont because they have an extremely they have extremely short roots, but a long long chamber for pulp. Um, so whereas ours sort of go in quite deep, theirs also go in deep, but they don't separate until quite far out. Um, not sure the reason why, but it's an interesting variation uh, that sort of further points to the fact that they are a different species than us. Now, there's something really interesting if we look at the shapes of the skulls from behind. Uh, I've got a uh, Homo sapiens on the right, Neanderthal in the center, Homo erectus on the left. Uh, you'll notice that the Homo erectus skull has many angles to it. It's almost a septagon, right? Um, Whereas the um, uh, the Homo sapiens skull is very rounded on top, but has parallel sides. Uh, the Neanderthal skull, on the other hand, is very sort of oblong, football-shaped. It's an oval. Um, so it's lower like the, the Homo erectus, but it's filled out a, to a great deal, uh, to a much greater extent. Um, what this means is that if you look at the position of the widest part of the skull, it's very low on the Homo erectus, it's kind of in the middle on the Neanderthal, and it's quite high on the um, Homo sapiens. Uh, this is, indicates changes in not just brain size, but brain structure as well. Uh, and we'll sort of see some of these in later videos. Postcranial anatomy. Postcranially, uh, they are shorter but stockier. They have a massive build. Uh, they follow both Allen's rule and Bergman's rule. Um, they have short uh, limb to body ratios and um, and uh, low um, volume to surface area ratios as well. Um, so they have massive build, short stature, a sort of barrel chest. Look at the shapes of the rib cages here. The uh, Neanderthal rib cage is almost conical, whereas ours is more sort of box-like. 
Um, uh, they have heavy muscle markings on the bones, uh, so much so that we speculate actually some of these individuals could have pre bench pressed maybe 500 pounds. I mean, they were extraordinarily strong. Um, and uh, the superior pubic ramus is somewhat more gracile, uh, so not as robustly built. Now, some of the most interesting stuff that we've discovered about Neanderthals has come through advances in genomics and genetics over the past 20 years. Um, and through the uh, use of PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, in recovering ancient DNA. Now, Neanderthal DNA has been worked on since um, the late 1990s. In 1997, uh, the anthropologist Svante Pavo uh, at the Max Planck Institute uh, published a paper in which he compared the mitochondrial DNA from uh, Neanderthal remains uh, the, a, to a bunch of modern human groups. Uh, and he was looking for overlap. The, why use mitochondrial DNA? Number one, it's more plentiful in each cell. So when you, it comes to ancient DNA, because DNA grades so, degrades so quickly, it, you're more likely to recover um, uh, usable fragments from mitochondrial DNA than from nuclear DNA. Secondly, he was looking at sections of mitochondrial DNA that are known to mutate um, rather uh, quickly and rather often, which, because we're talking about relatively short time periods here, remember, so, you, know, uh, uh, you know, 40 to 100,000 years roughly, um, we, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for relatively small changes. And so these are, those changes are more likely to show up in these regions than others. So, um, that's what he did. He sort of compared these regions in modern humans from, uh, different continents and with the ancient DNA. And what he came away with was that there was no overlap. Uh, um, no, no sort of significant sort of overlap. Uh, so the chances were that we didn't, uh, we didn't mix DNA at any point. Now, 2009 genome was published, 2010 analyzing the genome of the Neanderthal, we find that there's actually considerable overlap in nuclear DNA. So the nuclear DNA of European and Asian individuals, anybody who has uh, ancestry that isn't from Africa, um, will have between one and four percent of um, Neanderthal DNA in their genome. Uh, none for African individuals, which is even stronger evidence that this is uh, that that mating events occurred between the Homo sapiens who showed up in Europe and also other places where Neanderthals existed uh, and the Neanderthals. Now, how useful is ancient DNA? Well, when I started making these slides about 10 years ago, uh, we thought that 100,000 years was probably the outer limit that you could use these for. Um, because really, it, it, DNA degrades very quickly, and the older the DNA, the smaller the fragments are, which makes it harder to piece the, put the puzzle pieces together correctly. Um, however, in 2018, uh, a team of researchers s managed to successfully sequence the DNA of a 700,000-year-old horse that had been trapped in the Canadian tundra. Uh, being in the tundra like that, is probably what allowed them to do that because those extreme being kept at extremely cold temperatures for a long period of time helps protect the DNA from reacting with uh, the molecules in its environment. Um, that said, we have to be a little bit careful because the further out you get, the more work your algorithms that are figuring out how to match the pieces because we don't match them by hand. We have computers uh, algorithms that do that for us. And the more 
the smaller the pieces, the more work that algorithm's doing and the more room for artifacts in the algorithm uh, to interfere with the analysis. So you may be looking at an artifact of an algorithm, not of uh, the actual age of the, uh, or the actual sequence of, uh, of the DNA. In 2016, uh, the, some of the remains at Arapuerca were um, sequenced and dated to 430,000 years ago. Uh, as I said, though, we need to be very careful. The, the age is, the age isn't the problem here. It's whether or not the sequences are reliable that we have to be careful of. And remember, always with ancient DNA, when you're looking at hominins, the more closely related you are to the thing you're sequencing, the higher the risk of contamination. Uh, a little bit of your DNA gets in the mix and messes it all up. Now, we have ways of checking for that. But they're not 100% reliable, and we have to sort of, uh, we have to take extra precautions. That is why this researcher, for instance, uh, at the Cima de los Huesos is uh, covered up in a bunny suit, uh, respirating mask, face mask, all of that stuff. Sadly, the dream of Jurassic Park, and you know, this is really about as old as we're ever going to get things a hundred thousand sorry you know seven hundred thousand years i doubt we're going to get much beyond that may maybe if we're lucky a million but nobody's talking about things going beyond two million uh and to resurrect dinosaurs like this unfortunately you have to go a lot further back uh like 65 million years um that said, we can still tell a lot from this stuff. Um, the genomic data gives us slightly different dates for uh, the appearance and the, uh, the, the divergence of uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals than the fossil data does. That's to be expected, though. So there are a couple of things we need to be careful about. Uh, genetic clocks need to be carefully calibrated. Uh, to one another. Now, when you're talking about two species that are very closely related, they're probably very similar in terms of genetic clocks, so the rates at which genetic mutations accumulate. Um, but uh, the other thing is, genomic data is showing us something different from fossil data. Fossil data is showing us the um, uh, uh, showing us samples of individuals, okay? Genomic data is potentially showing us populations. Uh, when did these populations overlap? Still, they may have begun diverging, as you can see, 706,000 years ago for modern humans and Neanderthals. Uh, but the actual gene pool split may not have happened uh, until about 370,000 years ago. So you have this period of time when these lineages are getting different, but they're still, they're still intermixing, right? They're still part of the same species, same population. Uh, it's much later that you actually get this speciation event that occurs. Now, interestingly, along with this, in the early 2000s, there was a discovery of, sorry, the late, to, late, early 2010s, I should say. There was a discovery of uh, a couple of finger bones and some teeth in a cave in Siberia called, known in the local dialect as Denis's Cave or, uh, or Denisova. Um, and, uh, that's not enough to show a relationship just from the fossils between that fossil and any known hominin. We knew it was he human of some sort just from the shape of it, but to actually sort of match it up to another hominin is very difficult. They performed, uh, they extracted ancient DNA from it. And at first people were thinking, ah, well, we're going to see something like the top chart here. We're going to see Modern humans and Neanderthals splitting off quite early, and the Denisovans splitting off quite late. What we found instead was something very different. 
Uh, the bottom chart. Modern humans and Neanderthals split off first, and then Neanderthals and Denisovans split off. Um, these genetics are still highly contested. Um, we are gaining more fossils as the years go on, um, but we still have relatively few examples of these. But the genomes that we've extracted do have overlaps more so in people with ancestry in Asia than in Europe, and again, none in Africa. So we, again, we're having we're seeing the the this pattern of local uh, intermingling between these species. So we've got, you know, again, describing them as a separate species just from the genome may be a bit tricky. Uh, maybe they're just regional variation of Neanderthals, but still very very interesting. Okay. So next time, I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific adaptations of Neanderthals to their environment. How did nature and natural selection shape them? Until then, take it easy, have a great week, and I will see you soon.